So we finished our implications on clocking and now we're going to go into clock distribution or how do we build an actual clock tree. So let's discuss the clock routing problem. We have a source where the clock comes from and n sinks where the clock needs to go to. In this case, we have four flip-flops that it needs to go to. What we need to do is connect all the sinks to the source by an interconnect network, trying to minimize the clock skew, trying to minimize the delay, trying to minimize the total wire length, and trying to minimize the noise and coupling effect. Our goals basically are to minimize the skew and we also want to meet a target max insertion delay. Okay, so the challenge is that we need to synchronize millions, maybe even billions of separate elements and we have to do this in a time scale of picoseconds, like tens of picoseconds. The distances can be as much as like two to four centimeters on a really big chip. Um, so the ratio of synchronizing distance to the element size is on the order of 10 to the fifth. And just as a reference, light travels less than one centimeter in 10 picoseconds. So we're talking about something really, really, really hard to do. Um, we usually discuss the clock tree constraints or uh, the, the, as maximum transition, maximum load cap, maximum fan out, and maximum buffer levels. So that's, that's basically the problem that we're trying to solve. And I just want to mention a couple technology trends that come along with advanced technology. So when we look at timing, um, we obviously are always trying to get higher clock frequencies. And when you get a higher clock frequency, we probably want lower skew because we have to meet those max and min delays. Um, again, this higher clock frequency, it also brings us faster transitions. And what about jitter? Well, PLLs have gotten better with CMOS scaling over time, which is good, but we have other sources of noise that increase, such as the power supply noise is more important because we have lower uh, voltages and we have uh, switching dependent temperature gradients. What about new interconnect materials? Well, the introduction of, uh, I mean, the introduction of copper interconnects. So they provided us with lower RCs, which gives us be uh, better slew and potential skew. And you can see here that with aluminum, we had larger delays uh, going into copper. Not only were the delays larger, but the spread was smaller, which is a much better thing. It can provide us better uh, skew. Okay, locate dielectrics that were introduced as the interlayer dielectric that divides between the, um, the interconnects. That gives us lower clock power because we have less capacitance and better latency skew and slew rates okay it also gives us better coupling capacitance right um, and power well when we go to heavily pipeline designs to get better throughput that means we have more registers more registers more capacitive load for the clock larger chips well larger chips that means more wire length that needs to cover the that we need to cover the whole die um, finally we talk about complexity uh, complexity means we have more functionality, more devices. That probably means we have more clocked elements. And if we discuss something like dynamic logic, which isn't used as much anymore, then really all the elements had to be clocked. So how are we going to solve this problem? We'll take different approaches to clock tree synthesis, and we have this broad classification into three categories. The first one is what we mentioned, what we'll call a clock tree, and this is called clock tree synthesis because what most of us will be doing is building a clock tree, some sort of tree that has some sort of root that is the source of the clock. It's divided into different buffers that are divided into lower level buffers that finally meet the clock sinks at the end. There's a, a different approach that we'll discuss called the clock mesh or a clock grid, where we have this big type of a mesh that covers the whole chip and then we can just hang the sinks off of it. And we have some sort of kind of intermediate solution, which we call clock spines, where we have the source driving different like spines of the clock tree, which then um, we can have the, uh, the, the flip flops hanging off of. So let's go and discuss all of these. We'll start with clock trees. So the naive approach of a clock tree is, okay, we have these clock sinks. Why don't we just route one single net to each one? And we'll balance the RC of this, these nets. We'll make sure that this uh, line and this line, they all have the same exact length and so, so forth. Is that a good idea? Well, um, probably not. It would burn very excessive power because each one of these lines separately would uh, lead up to a very, very large capacitance. Um, and there would be lots of signal integrity issues because we'd have a lot of these lines that would be running next to each other and running next to the signal that also take up a huge amount of our routing resources. Anyway, it's not really feasible. But uh, uh, so we would what we would want to do is probably replace that with a buffered tree where each part of this is driven by uh, one or another buffer that drives more buffers and so forth. Um, 
this is much better solution because shorter nets each of these nets would be shorter and they, that means they have lower rc values each of these buffers restores the signal providing us with better slew rates and uh, the total insertion delay actually goes down because the rc to drive a longer net um, is really bad it actually um, increases uh, squared and we'd have less total switching capacitance because we have less rc so that's what we're going to do. We're going to build things with uh, buffered trees. And uh, how are we going to do that? So the best way or one of the best like kind of uh, approaches to it, theoretical approaches to build what we call an H tree. So if you see here, we have this clock source and it drives a, a buffer that drives an H. And the H means that at the end of each H, the distance from the source to each one of these points was exactly equivalent. So our RC is exactly equivalent. Then we put each one of these buffers will drive another H, and each one of these buffers will drive another H, and so forth until we get to our flip-flops at the end, and then we know that the RC is completely balanced. So we have this one large central driver, and we have a recursive H-style structure to match the wire lengths. Um, we have uh, the wire width at the branching points to reduce the reflections. Okay, but it's not really uh, feasible because our flip-flops aren't at each point here that's at the end of, uh, of the H tree. Uh, kind of a more feasible approach would be to do something like a tapered H tree where we'd have one of these bigger, like wider uh, wires with a huge buffer off of it. The buffer would uh, drive uh, wide wires, but not as wide, which would, be, would drive a bit smaller buffers, which would drive, again, going down and down in the size of the buffers and size of the wires until we get to these local buffers where each local buffer would drive a certain number of flip-flops that could be in a certain area. Again, this is still hard to do because in a certain area, we would need a certain number of flip-flops that would be similar for each area of the chip. And that probably is not going to happen, especially if we have different macros around the chip and different types of logic. Um, and these heterogeneous types of chips don't provide similar numbers and uh, flip-flops in every area. So that, that brings us to the standard CTS, standard clock tree synthesis approach. Um, since the flip-flops aren't distributed even, evenly, what we'll try to do is build a tree that will be balanced, but um, th this assumes that we don't have to be perfectly balanced because we assume that what happens is that when we have two flip-flops that are next to each other, um, they're in the same kind of a, a module, they'll be talking to each other, there'll be lots of paths between flip-flops that are close to each other, well, they're probably hanging off the same branch of the tree, and then the skew will be low anyway. Um, when we have a bit uh, farther away modules, but they'll probably still be close together if they have a lot of paths between them. So we have some sort of medium type of skew and jitter between these areas. We have very few paths probably from these modules over here and these modules that are very far away. And then we'll have skew and uh, we'll have to probably try to fix it. But um, that's kind of a, a standard CTS approach that's more feasible. So. An H tree is a great idea, and uh, it's been done before. Um, it's been tried to be done. So IBM uh, showed this at ISSCC 2002 uh, or 2000. They have their PowerPC architecture, which had these H trees, and you can really see the H's here in their conceptual design, but it had to still go around all kinds of obstacles and strange things like that. Um, uh, uh, a kind of a picture that appears in CMOS VLSI design is the Itanium 2, and you can see, uh, again, some sort of routing, which is kind of whatever, um, uh, looks kind of like H's in some way or another, but it's very far from being a real H tree. So we have this problem that we reach this high skew, and so we could take a different approach, which is to build a clock grid. So what we see here is we have this clock driver, which is a tree, a uh, really big tree. It could be even an H tree, no problem. That brings this huge driver um, that then um, drives this type of a mesh or a grid. And the mesh spans the whole tree, and it's a really equipotential type of area of, uh, of nets. And then in every place that we need to add a flip-flop, we just connect it to the grid, which is there and gets the uh, equipotential tree. And it doesn't matter if we have you know a few flip-flops here and a lot here or opposite, or we don't have one here and we do have one here. Still, every point on the mesh will be pretty much skew-balanced. 
So this has a real big advantages. The skew is determined by the grid sensi uh, density and not overly sensitive to the position of the actual loads. The clock signals are available everywhere, so we don't need to go and bring some buffers and distribute the clock to an area. It's already there, uh, basically based on the fact that we have the grid everywhere. Okay, it's very tolerant to process vari uh, variation and usually yields extremely low skew values. However, this costs a lot in terms of wiring and power. It takes up at least a whole, um, uh, basically, uh, layer of routing, um, which can be really expensive and infeasible to do. And the power is huge because the, the, the C of this, the capacitance of this is just huge. So we have a large wire cap. We need really, really, really strong drivers. And we'll see in the next uh, slide just how big the drivers have to be to, to drive this whole capacitance and get good transitions. And it, it just takes up a lot of uh, routing area. So to minimize all these pen penalties, what you could do is make the grid less dense uh, make the pitch coarser, but then your skew gets worse and you lose the main advantage of this approach. So how can you do it? You cannot over design and let the skew be as large as tolerable, but um, it just is not feasible for real uh, SOCs. Let's just take a look at when this was done. And uh, one of the places was in the Digital um, uh, Electronic Corporation. They had the alpha architecture and they had different generations of their alpha chips. And uh, starting with the EV4, the 21064 in 1992, what they did is they made this big central clock driver. So if we look, we can see here in the layout, there's this big driver, or we can see it in the conceptual layout over here. It, that's just one big buffer. Okay, and when we take clocking, you can often find uh, different websites and things that'll show you how uh, clocking happens in different cool uh, depictions. Here's a 3D graph of um, how we can see the hotter it is, the worse the skew is. And you see that in the middle, the skew is very low. But as you go farther out towards the sides of the chip, you see that the skew gets a, a, a lot worse. Um, and that, that's obvious because the farther you get from the drive, where the driver is, your skew will get worse, even though it's all still covered with a grid because you still have to drive that grid. But we just want to look at that. So this was in a, in a 0.75 micron uh, technology. The chip ran around 200 megahertz, had uh, around a million and a half transactions transistors um, that had this big central driver and a clock grid and it reached 240 picoseconds of skew so um, the guys at digital they went a step further and in the next generation the EV5 in 1995 already they went up and down to a 0.5 micron process they went up by 50% on their um, frequency and they had nine times more Four, four to nine times more transistors and uh, and here they went and they did this in a two stage so they had their central driver their main driver or pre-driver and it was driven out to the sides in these final drivers which meant that our distance to our farthest away uh, blocks was reduced by at least half okay so each of these guys had to drive uh, a lot less of a distance uh, our, our largest uh, way was a quarter of a chip away okay and then when we look at the skew type of uh, we have the the low skew the zero skew basically at the place of the drivers where they drive the grid but as we go further out we get higher skew even though and maybe these are the worst areas right um, it's not that bad. We get down to half of the skew we had before, so 120 picoseconds. But the total driver size, if you take the, this blue guy and these red guys, and we uh, we fit them together, we, we add up the total width of the drivers, we have 58 centimeters. That's not a mistake. That's 58 centimeters of width. So that is very a very, very big buffer, or few buffers, OK? Um, they went even further with, uh, in 1998, the EV6, the 21264. Um, it's, again, uh, a, more, uh, a more scaled technology, 0.35 micron. It already doubled the frequency at 600 megahertz and, again, almost doubled the number of transistors at 15.2 million transistors. And what they did here is they built a clock tree that um, went to four corners of the chip and uh, drove these... Uh, four drivers around each of these corners so each of these drivers now drove a clock grid in this corner and uh, made a nice skewing area and you can see it here where you have the little skew areas of the chip around here where we have a, a very low skew at the sides where that are driving these these guys these four big drivers here but again the area for the drivers was huge, 40 centimeter total driver size, but they were able to get down the skew to a very low 75 
uh, picoseconds. So again, the problem with that is that clock grids are really too power and routing hungry to use. So a different approach is to what, use what's called spines. And in spines, we'll decide on um, some areas, some spines, some uh, lines here, where we'll have, they're kind of like these drivers, which will route our uh, clock tree to it with some sort of type of H tree or balanced uh, buffering design. So each of these areas will be pretty much skew balanced, but from there, we'll build our local distribution off of the spines, which are pretty much equipotential. Um, you can see that in the Pentium 4 here, um, we had these uh, spine areas. So there are three spines. That's actually uh, the layout of this schematic over here. So we have these three spine areas, which we can take the clock off of. Okay. Um, at later Pentium 4s, they even used more spines. So you have these like really a lot of these spines, which you can uh, decide on really making the uh, skew to them um, equ equivalent, but then you can just get uh, your clocks from them to, to each flip-flop. Okay. So um, that's a, a more kind of practical approach. It doesn't get as good uh, um, skew uh, uh, skew results, but let's summarize the main uh, distribution approaches. So here's a little um, table that tells us what we can get. And when we when we take an H tree, what we're going to get is pretty good skew, um, and we're also going to get really low capacitance area and power. It's really a nice approach. The problem is the floor plan flexibility is very low, which makes it pretty much impractical to actually carry out as is. If we take a clock grid or a mesh, we're going to get the best skew. We're going to get really, really low skew. And the floor plan flexibility is excellent. We can just hang off a, a flip-flop anywhere uh, um, around the chip. The problem is that the capacitance area and power are just um, inconceivable. Okay, And um, finally, we can take this uh, median solution, which is a clock spine, where we're going to get OK uh, cap area and power, OK floor plan flexibility, but our skew isn't going to be great.